Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 125 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me that I think are worthy of your attention and maybe even doing something about. As always, comments, questions, reactions, tips, tidbits, whatever, can be emailed to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there. As always, if you do send me email, please be sure to include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line, something obvious so I know it's not spam. And uh, be a little patient. I'm a little slow about answering email, but I do answer. You will get an answer. All right, so with that, we're going to get right to it. And as I always like to, whenever I can, we're going to start with some good news. In October 2009, a 20-year-old woman named Hani Khan went to work at a Hollister Company store in uh, San Mateo, California. Hollister is a uh, wholly owned subsidiary of Abercrombie & Fitch. Khan is a Muslim who wears a hijab, that's the headscarf that is required by the religion. Company officials told her this wasn't a problem as long as the hijab was in company colors. Yeah, 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 company colors, right. See, Abercrombie, Abercrombie & Fitch, which is uh, under the leadership of this guy, CEO uh, Mike Jeffries, he, he actually always reminds me of the guy who's been obsessed with being cool ever since in high school he couldn't get to second base with Mary Lou Billingstone because she thought he was creepy. Um, anyway, he has a dress code uh, for the stores. Uh, he wants employees in natural beachy clothes like jeans, flip-flops, and a t-shirt. In fact, there is a very strict, almost micromanaging dress code for employees of the company, uh, including uh, um, detailed directions on how to roll your cuffs, your, your jeans cuffs, how to scrunch your sleeves above your elbow, and for women, how many buttons on their denim shirt to open. Three, in case you're counting. Jeffries is also the guy who got in hot water earlier this year when an old interview of his resurfaced in which he said he just wanted to market to good-looking popular kids and that some people do not belong in our clothes. Well, the point here, uh, again, is that Hani Khan was told her hijab would not be a problem so long as the color was in line with the dress code, which it was. Uh, nonetheless, four months later, in February 2010, a district manager visited the store, and a week later, Khan was told to stop wearing the hijab. When she said her religion did not allow for that and asked for a religious um, accommodation, which the company insists they do whenever possible, she was suspended, and a week later, she was fired. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, determined that she had been wrongfully terminated by the company, and, but the company refused to settle. So in June 2011, the commission sued on her behalf. The good news here is that on September 3rd, U.S. District Court Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers granted a motion for summary judgment against Abercrombie, ruling that, quoting, reasonable jurors could determine that by offering Khan one option to remove her hajib despite her religious beliefs, Abercrombie acted with malice, reckless indifference, or in the face of a perceived risk that its actions violated federal law. The judge also blew away the company's claims that accommodating her religious beliefs would create an undue burden on the corporation and would harm its brand image. She said, again quoting, the evidence presented does not raise to a triable issue that a hardship, much less than undue hardship, would have resulted from allowing Khan to wear her uh, hijab. Now that is, the company's claim of a hardship based entirely on what were called unsubstantiated opinion testimony of its own employees and generalized subjective beliefs or assumptions, the company's argument was so weak it wasn't even worth the court's time to consider. A trial to determine what back pay and damages Khan is owed, plus what measures the company will have to take to make sure this is not going to happen to somebody else in the future, uh, will begin the end of September. The best summary of the whole case came from Araceli martinez Olguin, an attorney with the Legal Aid Society Employment Law Center, which is representing Khan. Quoting, 
Abercrombie prides itself on requiring what it calls a natural classic American style, but there is nothing American about discriminating against someone because of their religion. Indeed. All right, we're going to keep sort of good feelings going for the moment because our next thing up is a hero award given as the occasion arises to people who just do the right thing on a matter big or small. This is a picture of a man named Wen Jones, a 43-year-old father of two, taken as he was being interviewed by ABC News recently. This is a picture of Wen Jones as he looked on May 19th. That's the day Jones was leaving Juno Beach Park in Florida when he came upon three 20-year-old men harassing a 14-year-old boy named Zion Wright. The trio had been kicking sand in the boy's face, calling him names. When Zion's father, a 55-year-old named Leroy Wright, arrived, he told the men to leave the beach. But the father later said, quoting him, I see these guys are not backing down, and I literally had to keep them at bay. That's when Jones arrived, and thinking the men were about to attack, stepped in. I couldn't stand there and watch this older guy and kid get beaten up, he said. He urged the men to calm down, but instead they turned their attention to him, and he was beaten unconscious. He suffered a concussion that he said still makes him feel groggy at times months later, along with fractured bones and an eye swollen shut, injuries that were bad enough to require surgery. When police showed up, the three men ran away. But what brings us up now is that thanks to cell phone video and people getting the license plate numbers, the cops tracked these guys down and last week the last of them was arrested. They all now face felony assault charges. Okay, that's why I bring it up now. Why bring it up at all? Quoting Jones, I'm not happy to have been injured pretty severely, but at the same time I ask myself, would I do it again? You know it was the right thing to do, so I probably would. You know doing the right thing is always the right thing. I said it before. I do it again. Those are the words of a hero. All right, from that, we have to go on to one of our regular weekly features. It's the outrage of the week. For the past 15 years, it's going to take a little explanation, so follow this. For the past 15 years, the U.S. has been running a supposedly pilot program that would examine a possible way to increase efficiency at meat processing plants with the goal of, and the same claim that's always made when this kind of thing is being done, uh, that it would reduce prices to consumers. All right, what are the essentials of this plan? I'm going to quote the Washington Post. The program allows meat producers to increase the speed of processing lines by as much as 20% and cuts the number of USDA safety inspectors at each plant in half, replacing them with private inspectors employed by the meat companies. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan, assuming your goal is corporate profit instead of public health. The program is called the Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point-Based Inspection Models Project, commonly referred to as HIMP or HIMP. It's been used for years now at five American hog plants under this pilot program. And it's worked just like you might expect. Three of those five are among the ten worst safety violators in the entire industry. Uh, Safety violations have included failing to remove fecal matter from the meat, And the plant with the worst record by far is one of those five. This new meat inspection pilot program uh, dates to uh, 1997. It was welcomed at the time by the meat industry, (laughs) there's a shock, which uh, saw it as a way to increase their profits by moving more meat through the slaughterhouses in a day while reducing government oversight. At the time this was instituted, this pilot program, the USDA promised to study the performance of the new inspection procedures adopted by these hog plants. It never did. 15 years years later, it still hasn't. It has never studied whether the program was meeting its supposed goals. Six USDA inspectors spoke to the Washington Post on the condition of anonymity because they said they were afraid they'd be fired if their names were known. They say inspectors are yelled at, threatened, and shunned if they try to slow down these uh, these increased uh, these faster lines, um, and that uh, 
if they get they get troubled, if they, you know, complain a little too much about there not really being any proper safety procedures. We are no longer in charge of safety, said one of them. The safety inspectors are no longer in charge of safety. Meanwhile, other countries have been allowed to import meat to the United States under inspection systems that are deemed to be equivalent to those in the pilot program. And recently, they've seen a number of problems. For example, Canada was first allowed to do this in 2006. Last fall, a Canadian beef processing plant using this system had to recall 8.8 .8 million pounds of beef and beef products, about 2.5 million pounds of which were went to the U.S. market. At least 18 Canadians were poisoned by this contaminated beef. Many were hospitalized with diarrhea, inflamed bowels, and internal bleeding. Australia joined in 2008. And since the beginning of 2012, 11 shipments of beef, mutton, and goat meat from Australian plants using this system were stopped at U.S. ports because of contamination, including fecal matter and partly digested food. New Zealand was given uh, permission to do this in uh, 2011. Now, nothing has been rejected at U.S. ports yet. But a representative of the Government Inspectors Union in New Zealand said that the processing lines are moving too quickly to actually catch uh, cases of contamination, and there's not proper oversight by the private company inspectors. They wind up, one said, leaving chunks, was his word, of fecal matter on the carcasses. So we have a program that has never been evaluated, has compromised safety in the eyes of the very online people who are supposed to be the ones protecting it, and it's failed in other countries. And what's the response? Elizabeth Hagen, the USDA's Undersecretary for Food Safety, this title must be an inside joke, you know, but uh, the Undersecretary for Food Safety has praised the new inspection procedures. This spring, Hagen told the Food Chemical News, this is a trade publication, that uh, the pilot initiative has produced safety results that the department is very satisfied with and has confidence in. And after not having evaluated the program for the past 15 years, the USDA now says it will complete an evaluation by next March and hopes at that point to make the case to extend the system to all 608 U.S. swine plants. So what in heaven's name are they proposing to evaluate? What are they studying? I mean, if, you've, if they've already decided they're comfortable with the results, and they're already saying that months from now they want to try to expand the program nationwide, what are they studying? This is inane. By the way, dozens of chicken plants have also been enrolled in a similar pilot program, one that includes expanded use of toxic bacteria-killing chemical sprays on the processing line. The USDA intends to allow these procedures to be used by all chicken and turkey plants by some, sometime this year, even though the Occupational Safety and Health Administration has connected worker illnesses to those chemical sprays. Bon appétit must be French for it's an outrage. We're taking a break. And we're back. I'm actually going to spend a little time now talking about uh, Syria, uh, talking about the, the situation about Syria. And I say about because the situation in Syria is pretty much the same as it's been all along. People are dying every day. But the situation about Syria is, as they say, in flux. This happened because of a supposedly off-handed comment made by Secretary of State John Kerry. He was asked if there was anything Syrian President Bashar al-Assad could do to head off a U.S. attack, and he said, quoting, sure, he could turn over every single bit of his chemical weapons to the international community in the next week. This was downplayed by the White House reps and by the State Department and labeled an off-the-cuff statement intended to show the impossibility of Assad doing that or being willing to do that. But it turned out that the idea had actually been broached by Russian President Vladimir Putin during his meeting with President Barack Obama during the G20 summit last week. So maybe Kerry's comment wasn't so unplanned. Maybe it was a way to signal Putin that this idea could now be in play, particularly since Obama's chances of getting his war resolution passed through Congress were getting dimmer by the day. If so, 
Putin seemed more than willing to take the opening. Within hours, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov had promised to press Syria to accept the terms. Syrian Foreign Minister Walad al molem then embraced the proposal, as did Assad himself on Tuesday. Now, the thing is, I've long said that if you want to avoid a war, if you want to end, uh, avoid the death and bloodshed that even a so-called limited attack will bring, then you have to give the other side a way to back out without appearing to back down. Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember the actual source. It was a man who was for a number of years the editor of Foreign Policy magazine, but he once said very cogently, he said that historically, given a choice between humiliation and war, nations have shown a depressingly consistent preference for the latter. So this deal may be a way to allow both sides, both Obama and Assad, to back out without appearing to back down. But right now I'm not so sure this will work out and we may be right back at the same place in a couple of weeks. Maybe I'm wrong, hopefully I'm wrong, especially since Assad has now said that Syria will abide by the Chemical Weapons Convention, which means he is at least implicitly promising to destroy weapons, which a couple of days before he denied he even had. Um, but well, we'll see. The problem, as always, is the devil in the details, and there were already red flags going up, if I can sort of pile up metaphors there. The U.S. said it would take a hard look at the proposal, which does involve working through the U.N. Security Council, and Obama even asked Congress to delay the Senate vote on his war resolution, which wouldn't have passed anyway, but he asked Congress to delay the vote. Uh, but he also said he is skeptical of Assad's and by extension Putin's motives, uh, which is a stance echoed by others in his administration. For example, Kerry said Syria must go further than declaring its chemical weapons stockpiles and signing the international treaty that bans them. He said the Syrian, govern Syrian government must live up to what they have already promised and cooperate with Russia to work out a formula by which those weapons could be transferred to international control and destroyed which could be taken as wanting proof of sincerity on Syria's part or as goalpost shifting, depending upon your point of view. Even so, the White House has said that Obama has agreed to discussions at the United Nations Security Council on the Russian proposal to secure Syria's chemical weapons stockpiles. Obama discussed the idea with French President Francois Hollande and uh, British Prime Minister uh, David Cameron. French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius says France was going to propose a resolution to the UN Security Council aimed at forcing Syria to make public its chemical weapons, uh, place them under international control and dismantle them. What's more though, the US, the UK and France want any Security Council resolution to include a timetable for this to be done and want it to be passed, the resolution to be passed under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter which allows for military action if other methods have, have not worked. The White House says that any resolution lacking a timetable is a stalling tactic and that the US will not fall for that. Russia, on the other hand, rejected the French draft, said that any text putting the blame on Syria for the August 21st gas attack was unacceptable. It urged a Security Council declaration backing its own initiative, one to be passed under Chapter 6 of the Charter, which does not allow for military action. Lavrov told Fabius that Russia would not countenance a resolution threatening Syria with force and it seems frankly unimaginable that Obama could uh, or politically would accept a resolution lacking some means of enforcement. And even when you get past all of that, there is still simply the practical matter of trying to do this in the middle of a civil war when accounting for dismantling weapons of any sort is hard enough in peacetime. But anyway, that's where we stand now. So what I want to do now is take a couple of minutes with some general observations about Syria. One of them is that a number of people, mostly but not exclusively on the left, have raised questions about whether or not Assad actually ordered the gas attack on August 21st. The basis for this is that one of the strongest pieces of evidence the U.S. has presented to tie the regime to the attack is a panicky phone call from a Syrian defense of, uh, official to the leader of a chemical weapons unit which the U.S. intercepted. The thing is, to that very extent that that call ties the regime to the gas attack, to that very same extent, it raises the question about whether or not this was ordered or whether or not it was some low-level commander doing this on their own. 
Well, I have to say that for me, whatever the legalities, whatever the technicalities, I still say this leaves Assad responsible. He ordered the creation of the weapons, he ordered the distribution of the weapons, he created the mechanisms for their use. We on the left traditionally have not been willing to let the higher ups go and let the grunts take all the blame. There's no reason we should start now. For example, when, when Abu Kharaib came to site, uh, came, came to, to site um, we were not willing to exculpate the generals who created the conditions under which that prison operated because they didn't specifically order the torture. The same should apply here. Another point is that the American public is clearly even overwhelmingly opposed to a military strike. For example, a Huffington, Ghost, uh, Huffington Post YouGov poll found just 18% thought that U.S. airstrikes against the Syrian government would stop the use of chemical weapons. 48% thought they wouldn't. 57% said airstrikes would not help end the fighting in Syria. And pluralities said that the attacks would increase the rate of civilian casualties and the mission would be a first step toward U.S. troops in Syria. An ABC News poll had 50% of respondents opposing the U.S. taking military action in Syria, compared with 42% who supported it, and a whopping 79% who said the president should be required to get congressional approval before taking any action. The ABC News Washington Post poll showed 59% of Americans opposed to these missile strikes, and a majority remain opposed even if it's presented as an allied effort rather than a U.S. effort. And then we have the administration's pathetic claims that this is not a war. Seriously? Really? You're going to drop a, what one of your supporters described as, a few hundred cruise missiles on like 50 sites spread around Syria and then claim we're not going to war? What then do you say to Representative Zoe Lofgren? Uh, he said, quote, she said, anyone who argues that shooting missiles and dropping bombs on another country is not an act of war, they need to go back to school. She also said that if somebody shot cruise missiles at Washington for just one day, we'd say that was war, wouldn't we? And what's more, what do you say to General Martin Dempsey, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who said about Syria in a letter to Senator Carl Levin on July 19th that, quoting, the decision to use force is not one that any of us takes lightly. It is no less than an act of war. And, you know, for all the talk about limited uh, this and restricted that and not doing the other, Kerry still left open the possibility of boots on the ground in his testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, in the event that, for example, he said, if Syria, for example, implodes. He tried to walk that back, but the point is this idea still hangs out, like hangs out there like a bad smell in the air. A particularly bad smell because despite its claims that it's not actually, I'd like to see Assad overthrown, but it's not actually trying to do anything about it. The Obama administration is considering a plan to use U.S. military trainers to help increase the capabilities of the Syrian rebels. Right now, such training is being done by the CIA and the number of trainees measures in the dozens. If the military takes it over, that number could rise to the thousands. Finally, one last thing, and it's too big for today, too big for today, but uh, I will get back to this next week because no matter, no matter what happens at the UN, no matter what happens with regard to any of this, this will remain an issue. It's the number of people, a number of leaders, including people on the supposed left, or at least liberals, who are openly avowing that the president, any president, can openly ignore the Constitution, can openly ignore the Congress, and attack any country, anywhere, anytime, uh, whatever, on their own authority, answerable to no one, anytime they think it's a good idea, because they are the Commander-in-Chief. This is a remarkably dangerous idea, and I will talk more about it. But, we are going to finish up today with our other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award. Um, this week, uh, it's given, as always, for meritorious stupidity. Uh, and this week, the... Uh, oh, by the way, before I do this, before I do this, uh, I have to mention, there's a quick note about why I retired Pat Robertson from competition for the Clown Award. On his show, The 700 Club, a couple of weeks ago, Robertson said in response to a question about HIV AIDS that there are people in the gay community in San Francisco who wear a special ring so that when you shake, your hand, shake their hands, it cuts your finger and gives you AIDS. 
This is so bad that even the Christian Broadcasting Network cut it out of the show before it aired, but you can find it on YouTube. Having Pat around just wasn't fair to the other aspirants, so he's retired. Anyway, this week, the big red nose goes to Missouri State Senator Brian Neves. Now, I've mentioned here once before, back in July, when he referred to abortions done to save the life of the mother as just a matter of convenience. And the truth is, there are multiple reasons he could have been dishonored with the Clown Award. One is that uh, back in April, he got into a bizarre email flame war with a constituent named Bart Cohn, who originally just wanted to be taken off uh, Neve's mailing list, which Neve wouldn't do because, unless Cohn explained how he got on the list in the first place, which is doubly weird because um, the response of a normal person would be to say, you're off the list. And because Neves later said that anyone who emailed them had their email, uh, email addresses captured and put on the list. Neves got creepier and creepier as the exchange progressed and at the end wound up saying that Cohn must be in love with him or obsessed with him and gave us a parting shot. By the way, you really don't look good in a beard, which besides being the obvious kind of subtle, you know, I know who you are threat, it really raises the question of just who is obsessed with who. Um, another reason is that Neves is leading the fight in the Missouri legislature to overturn a veto by Governor Jay Nixon of the legislature, that, uh, of legislation rather, that declared federal gun laws null and void in the state. But here's why it comes today. His campaign announced plans to give away an assault weapon during a clay pigeon shooting fundraiser next month. That's right, chip in, a, chip in 100 bucks for a raffle ticket and you could walk away with a brand new Sig Sauer 516 Patrol AR-15, an alternate version of the same sort of weapon that was used to commit slaughters in Aurora, Colorado and Newtown, Connecticut. Attend the fundraiser, cost you, cost you 25 bucks. If you want to shoot, it'll cost you 100, but for the big spenders, there are increased levels right up to $1,500. Yep, for 1,500 bucks, you get four shooter packages, six station sponsorships, and six of only 50 chances at the gun with the blood-soaked pedigree. The name for this level? Sniper level. In a remarkable understatement, Sean Nicholson, Executive Director of Progress Missouri, called that label troubling. It's not troubling, it's sick. And those who celebrate it, including Senator Neves, are sick as well. Now I have to tell you very quickly, I can understand the attraction of, of clay pigeon shooting or skeet shooting. It does take skill, and basically you get to blow stuff apart without actually hurting anybody or anything. But it's done with shotguns not with semi-automatic firearms that can take down 82 people, 12 of them dead, in a theater in Colorado, or, or kill 26 children and teachers in a school in Newtown, Connecticut, in each case in less than 15 minutes. Neves is not celebrating sport, he's celebrating death. He is a clown of death. And we're going to use that in order to wrap up with our regular weekly feature, um, our uh, weekly reminder. As of September 10th, at least 7,915 Americans have been killed by gunfire in the U.S. since Newtown. At least 79 of them in Massachusetts. That's it. Have the best week you can. We will see you next week.